Dr. Carl Brown teaches courses in the, uh, in the history of Europe, cinema, and beer at UW Whitewater. <laughs> Prior to acquiring a PhD in history from the University of Texas at Austin, Carl was a professional brewer in Japan and Greece. Most recently, he helped open the second Salem Nano Brewery in Whitewater. He lives in Whitewater with his wife, Brianne, and children, Margaret and Nels. Welcome, you, um, UW Whitewater professor, Carl Brown. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Jay. Um, is, is my mic working? Yes, it is. is. One, two, we're bombing Russia in five minutes. That's, 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 <laughs> my, that's, that's my favorite uh, from old record joke. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I'd like to thank uh, Kerry Bourne and UW Continuing Ed for giving me the chance to present some of the things I'm working on as I prepare to teach my uh, history of beer class again this spring. Also, Melissa, thank you for the uh, chance to talk here. That's, Good to meet you. And I look forward to talking with uh, all of you as well um, after my roughly 45 minute lecture. Um, like most academics, I could talk for hours on end, but that gets a bit boring. And, and, it's, and it's much more interesting to me to find out some of what you all know about local uh, culture, beer, Germans, et cetera, Wisconsin, okay? So what I'm gonna do today is uh, start off looking broadly at beer and culture, going back to archeological prehistoric times, uh, and then we'll get into, and then we'll skip about 400, 1400 years there, we'll get into Wisconsin, and look at uh, German immigration here and how the Germans bring uh, both their drinking habits and also their politics with them to the US. This is gonna get us into uh, World War I. I'll finish up by talking about prohibition, and I think that one of the key elements to um, to think about in terms of prohibition is uh, what most scholars leave out about it is, uh, is I think a lot of it comes down to some anti-German sentiment fomenting throughout the 19th century and really culminating during World War I. That's kind of one of my theses here that I'll be advancing for you as we go on. But um, starting off, let me start with what I hope is a relatively uncontroversial statement. Um, Germans are beer drinkers. Does anybody have any problem? I agree because I'm German. <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, danke schön. Um, bearing that in mind, let's go ahead and uh, kick head here to uh, ancient beer. Okay. Brewing originates uh, possibly as early as 9,000 uh, years uh, BC. That is at the Gobekli Tepe site in Turkey. The photograph here is of a couple of troughs that are thought to have been used to brew beer. Um, but in terms of actual paleobotanical evidence, that is actual, that, that, uh, in terms of evidence of, of beer having been brewed based on uh, the residue of the fluids found, we can definitely track the brewing of beer back to the Jiahu site in China, like about 7,000 BCE. Okay, so brewing has been around for thousands of years. And there's actually debate amongst um, archaeologists and anthropologists starting in the 1950s or thereabouts as to whether it was beer or grain that led to uh, the invention of civilization. That's what I mean. Egypt and elsewhere, right? The argument here being that you could grow enough grain to feed your family, or sorry, you, um, as a hunter-gatherer, you could collect enough grain to feed your family uh, without having to actually cultivate it. It's when you want to grow enough grain to start actually converting it into, into beer and alcohol, that's when you have to settle down, start building farming communities, start building towns, villages, things like that, okay? So it's possible that beer helped start civilization, arguably. Um, uh, bring that in mind, uh, beer, is, beer, uh, beer and uh, drinking is inextricably linked with, with um, uh, civilization going back to its earliest phases. We can see here on the left uh, a couple of uh, hieroglyphs from Egypt um, representing how Egyptians um, consumed alcohol at times. Uh, it's striking to me how my undergraduates at the university seem to replicate these ancient rituals on an almost weekly basis by even knowing about the historical roots thereof. But point is, beer and civilization go way back, way back, right? Uh, case in point, oh, hang on a second. Uh, the pyramids were not built by slave labor, as is commonly thought, but by workers who were paid on a daily basis between, uh, between two to four loaves of bread and two gallons of beer. Now that's not as strong as modern beer as probably. <laughs> I see some shocked faces in the background. Um, yeah, uh, two gallons, but, but uh, ABV is probably four point something percent, as far as we can tell from recreating uh, these ancient uh, uh, brewing recipes, right? In any case, again, beer and civilization goes back to helping build the pyramids, no less, right? Okay, 
Then, with the um, with uh, the spread of uh, Czechs, uh, sorry, Czechs and Celts uh, throughout Europe in the period um, roughly a thousand years uh, prior to uh, prior to birth of Christ, we see uh, the spread of beer culture with them. Right, the uh, the photograph here and the graphic here at the left at the left is at the Hochdorf site, a burial site, uh, a Celtic site unearthed, uh, I think, uh, uh, fifty years ago thereabouts, which um, in which a, a Celtic uh, lord has been interned with um, with various. Uh, uh, things from his life, chief among them a 92 gallon copper vat that, uh, that was actually found with a beer residue inside. Okay, so we can track uh, brewing culture to the Celts throughout Europe at this point. And also by this point, we've, we've rest long, uh, well past the Stone Age. We're actually using metal vessels for, for brewing our beer. Okay? Let me stop there. Are there any questions before I go on? I, I tend to speak pretty swiftly, so I'll just kind of stop <coughs> you to, to give a chance to, to speak up. No? Well, here we go. Okay, so here's the thing. The Greeks and the Romans come along, and for lack of a better way to put it, they're complete wine snobs. Uh, that is, uh, that now, this, the, the, the reason for Greek and Roman preferences for wine over beer probably have a number of uh, uh, causes uh, afoot there, right? In terms of geography, these are empires that cluster around the Mediterranean, so the climate is ideal for growing grapes, right? Whereas, uh, um, also in terms of the uh, labor that goes into growing grapes, and also, and also simply the time of uh, fermentation and maturation until it's ready to drink, well, the, um, the Mediterranean region also sort of lends itself more to wine growing culture. Moreover, just in terms of just how uh, the, 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 I think the stability of these empires as they're formed is over time, uh, people would uh, make some wine and put it up and wait for a while. And to do so, you have to be a stable, I mean, you have to be in a stable sort of a society. You can't be a hunter gatherer wandering around. Um, um, Packed up your brewery every time you try and make beer, right? Or, or a winery in this case, right? So it's it's important to think about these other variables and looking at the the centrality of wine in these early empires, okay? But be it, be that as it may, uh, um, by the time the Greek and especially the Roman Empire come along, uh, pretty much wine has been coded as an elite drink for the most part, and beers with the commoners or even the barbarians drink, right? That is, as as especially the Roman Empire comes into contact with the Celts and also the Goths for the north of the empire. Um, they come into contact with these beer drinking cultures who are also seem to be much less civilized uh, than the Romans, right? The term barbarian actually is onomatopoeic. That is the, uh, the, lang the language, the, 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 the Gothic langu language sounded like people just saying bar, 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 bar to the uh, Romans. That, that's the term barbarian. It's actually based on what they thought the language sounded like. Right. In any case, beer is what those barbarians drink. Wine is what civilized people drink. And um, what happens as the Romans uh, conquer uh, Gaul, this modern France, a Celtic society in the couple hundred years after Christ, uh, the conquered Celts assimilate Roman wine culture. Uh, that is where they, in essence, assimilate these Roman values. That is, they, they, to, to be truly civilized or, or elite or what have you, you have to drink wine instead of beer. Okay. Um, it's important, I think, not to, uh, not to draw a direct dichotomy between uh, Romans and Greeks drinking wine, barbarians drinking beer on the other. Of course, people in both societies uh, drank both, uh, depending on their social status, occupation, things like that. But for the most part, we have a, a wine-centered um, beer drinking culture in the empire, beer drinking culture in the, the various quote-unquote barbarian lands around them. Okay. Footnote, the type of beer uh, most commonly consumed in, in Europe at this time was made from wheat rather than barley. The Latin term for that was, was uh, cenobicia, which, uh, who knows how to say uh, beer in Spanish? Cerveza, right? Direct, direct linguistic root from the, from the Latin to the Spanish, OK? Um, let's see. I, this is a striking example of how these, of how beer and wine cultures coexisted. Okay, this is an annular flask that was unearthed in uh, Paris from the early Roman Empire uh, period. It's in essence uh, 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 sort of a, uh, uh, a hollow uh, ring, in essence, with a spout at the top. And um, on one side is printed "Waitress, fill the flask with wheat beer." On the other, innkeeper, do you have spiced wine? It needs to be filled. <laughs> right? so, so, so whichever one you wanted, you'd see the hold of the bartender, and then if you were feeling different, you could just flip. The yeah, put the flats and get the other beverage, right? So yeah, these cultures are, are, are existing alongside each other throughout the entire period of the Roman Empire and such, okay? 
So here come the Germans, part one. <laughs> uh, spoiler alert, Rome falls. I'm sorry for those of you who didn't know that, but the Roman Empire is uh, destroyed in, in 410, uh, 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 and the year 410, and the Visigoths, uh, sorry, the Visigoths, a, a Germanic tribe, are to blame for this. In essence, in terms of this sort of uh, uh, tension between beer and wine cultures, where wine cultures are, are triumphant with the force of the empire, so as the force of the empire wanes, so does beer culture become, come to predominate throughout Europe, right? And as we'll see with the spread of the Germanic tribes throughout Europe thereafter, this is really when, I mean, again, wine drinking and beer drinking coexist side by side for the most part. People down around the Mediterranean will drink more wine because it's easier to, to grow grapes there and to ferment them. But this is really sort of the, uh, the triumph of beer over wine, right, that is during, uh, in, for most of Europe in the period after the fall of the Roman Empire, okay? Okay, let's take a moment. Any questions? Wine, beer, barbarians, quote unquote, civilized peoples, and the relationship between these two as, as an essence sort of like, I think, central to uh, drinking culture spring up around these drinks. Any questions so far? Yes, sir. Uh, you mentioned Gold Ghibli uh, Tepe. <coughs> yes. 9,000 years ago, first evidence of beer. Uh, is there no evidence of beer in the Paleolithic era? Oh, dear. Um, uh, the, the Turkish sites are the earliest um, uh, structures that are thought to have been used for brewing beer, and then in terms of actual paleobotanical paleo evidence, again, actually finding residues of, of ancient brews, for that we turn to China and the Jiahu site. Um, I don't know of anything earlier than that. Although, I mean, um, there are brewers who have reenacted brewing in a, in a, a Stone Age context with, with, with big stone troughs and using uh, heated stones to try and brew those beers. Uh, and so something like that probably occurred prior to that. But um, th 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 there's as yet, I don't know of any archaeological evidence to that effect. Thank you. Good question. Other questions? I have a, one question. Yes, ma'am. As you know, pr you probably know more than I do, that uh, the Reinheit skip mold from the beer, which is just the basic Hopfenmalz, uh, Hefe, Wasser, without chemicals. And it's a secret why you can get beer here, but there are with chemicals involved. And that's why the beer doesn't taste the same like in, like in comparison to Germany. So when, speaking of the past, can I ask when did they find out uh, when to add the chemicals, you know? Was it always? You are, getting, you are getting just ahead of me. In fact, the very next slide, I addressed the Ryan Heights group on 1516. Okay, so um, let me get to that, okay? So th let me just uh, com co commit a complete foul um, as, um, as a historian and say for about 400 years, not much happens, which of course is aligning all types of events in, in, the, in the time period in question. But for our purposes, in terms of looking at beer and culture and then trying to get to Wisconsin before we have to go home to bed, um, a couple a couple of key a couple, I would say three important things happen in the history of brewing um, in, the, in, in the intermediate period, right? First off, hops begin uh, being used in beer um, from about the 19th, uh, sorry, from about the 9th century onwards or thereabouts. They're first cultivated in the 600s, but then per, first probably used in beer in about the 800s or thereabouts. And the thing is that um, prior to that, uh, beer was probably flavored with various, with, uh, various combinations <laughs> of spices and herbs called gruit. Uh, that is, uh, uh, to make the beer more palatable. And the thing is, hops are not intuitively something to add to beer. They're bitter, and most taste, and, and, and for the most part, uh, people want to taste sweet things rather than bitter ones, right? Mm -hmm. It turns out that hops are a good preservative, and this then is the rationale for adding them uh, to beer for about the 800s uh, onwards. And then in 1516, the Rheinheitske Book, or the German Purity Law, uh, decrees that beer should be made only with barley, hops, and water. Right? Now, this is held up as sort of like a standard of, of a purity, like defining what is real beer and what is not. Actually, what happened at the time is that there was a, sh a, sh uh, there was a grain shortage, and too many brewers were using uh, uh, rye and wheat to make beer as well. So the, so the so German princes, uh, in doing so, they are establishing a, a purity standard, but they're also trying to ensure that the rye and wheat goes to making bread instead of beer. Right? This, is a, this is a very conscious decision on their part to focus on some types of grains that, uh, rather than others for beer brewing. Right? Um, and then America is discovered by Vikings, the Columbus, et cetera, like about the whenever. I don't, um, I'll just skip that part and go on. So, well, here come the Germans, part two, Wisconsin, right? Um, um, as you all probably know, the, uh, the, the German presence in Wisconsin is, a, it, it is more so than any other ethnicity, I think, in terms of um, immigrant culture. It's roughly one in, well, I think, um, 
by the turn of the 20th century, one in three Wisconsinites were either, uh, were either German born or of German extraction, right? So it's a major uh, migration coming over from Europe to the US at this time, settling primarily in uh, Milwaukee, called the German Athens at the time, and also in uh, Dane, Brown, and Taylor counties. And uh, as these Germans come to the US, they bring their brewing uh, styles and their drinking culture with them. Okay, this starts as early as uh, 1844, when a man named Jacob Best buys a 10 barrel, about a 300 gallon copper vat, and starts a brewery in uh, Milwaukee. He's important because it's his daughter Maria who marries Frederick Pabst in 1862. Pabst becomes a part of the brewery in 1864, and thereafter this is the start of the Pabst Brewing Empire. So, I mean, again, Pabst for much of the history of brewing in America, is one of the is the other major brewery aside from Anheuser Busch, right? So the Pabst, the, the, the earliest origins of what will become the Pabst Brewery uh, occur in, a, in 1844, and then it turns out that uh, Jacob's son Charles founds the Plank Road Brewery, uh, which uh, by the 20th century turns into the Miller Brewing Company. Okay, so for one, so from one German immigrant family, we have two of the major breweries in American history founded again right sort of at this earliest moment of German settlement in Wisconsin. Yeah. Okay, so drinking like a German, <laughs> aside from a lot. One of the, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, significantly, the Germans, uh, the, these German immigrants are looking for a different type of beer than what is being brewed in the U.S. at the time. Okay, now up until about the mid-19th century, uh, you've got uh, pretty much all malt beers brewed in the U.S. with um, uh, uh, with some hops added and whatnot, but, the, but they're almost invariably, but they're almost invariably <laughs> probably closer to what we call an amber ale today, right? Much darker in color, uh, probably heavier bodied, uh, and some hop character as well, right? The thing is that um, on the uh, as of the 1870s, there are barley shortages, and also the, uh, just 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 in terms of uh, a brewing technology, there are some problems with a uh, beer haze, various other issues with all malt beer, which makes brewers start looking for alternate types of grain to use in their beers. Okay. Now, at roughly the same time in Europe, the Bohemian Pilsner style has become popular in Europe. It's named that after its origin in the town of Pilsen in what is today the Czech Republic. And this is a very, very different beer. It, it, it's, it's lighter in color, first off. It, it's uh, much hoppier, and, um, and uh, it also involves large amounts of rice as an adjunct. That is, rice is used rather than barley for brewing it. Now, nowadays we see the use of rice by major breweries like Budweiser, Coors, or the rest as kind of a cop-out, right? Is they're not using all barley, they go ahead and, and using rice just to fill out uh, the malt bill. It's important to mind, it's important to mind that at the time, rice was more expensive than barley. So this is a conscious decision by the brewers to adapt rice, or to, to start using rice uh, as a means of making this, this new, more appealing beer. Um, rather than today when it's used basically uh, 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 sort of um, as a surrogate for, for an all barley, for an all barley malt bill. Okay, so um, at the outset, at this time period, uh, rice is actually being used at, um, as an adjunct despite the fact that it costs more than barley. Okay? So this new beer, this Pilsner style, becomes popular in Europe, especially after 1873, when the Pilsner beer sweeps the uh, Vienna Exposition of that year. And this is also in one of the first sort of uh, legal issues, uh, uh, services between Anheuser-Busch, who markets a, a style of beer called Budweiser, which, has a, which uh, comes into conflict with a Czech uh, brewery in the town of Budweiser, which is also named Budweiser. Right? So, the, so the original Budweiser is actually a European, not an American uh, label. Right? In any case, as of about the mid to late 19th century, we've got Germans um, uh, uh, as, as some of the major customers uh, for this new beer style. As more Germans come here, the style becomes more popular, and more and more Americans get turned on to this uh, lighter beer style as well. Okay. This gets us to um, Looking to, to look briefly at the industry here for a minute, because most breweries switched to lagers or pilsners by about the 1880s. In Wisconsin, we have a large number of regional breweries, Leinen Kugels, Blatt's, uh, various other ones uh, that you all heard of. I, I got to think about it, I couldn't think of a single one that was not founded or run by a German immigrant. That is, the vast majority of them are 
are, are uh, coming directly out of this influx of uh, German peoples to Wisconsin in the 19th century, right? So in Wisconsin, you have local competitors like Leidenkugels, Blatz, um, and others. But in terms of the national beer scene, this comes down to two major breweries, duking it out for most of the 19th and then most of the 20th century as well, is Pabst versus Anheuser-Busch, located in St. Louis, Missouri, also founded by a German immigrant, I might note. But these are the two, be uh, uh, these are the two behemoths, basically, the juggernauts of American brewing. Uh, they're both constantly competing with each other for, uh, uh, for market share, trying to undercut, trying to undercut each other's uh, prices. It's just really cutthroat competition between the two uh, going into uh, 1893 when uh, the Chicago Exposition occurs, sorry, the, the, when the World's Columbian Exposition occurs in Chicago. Um, how many of you are familiar with this event? From reading Eric Larson's Devil in the White City or other books like this? Okay. This is this remarkable moment, this exposition where, uh, where uh, companies and countries from all over the world would come and demonstrate uh, their products, their cultures, and things like that, right? So, th so this entire uh, 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 exposition city is built almost from, almost from scratch on the shore of, of Lake by Chicago. Here's a photograph of uh, the White City, sort of this long uh, promenade with a pool in the middle and all these lit uh, uh, buildings along the sides live with electricity, interest, uh, sort of a, a new uh, source of power at the time. Uh, the first Ferris wheel is, is, is demonstrated at this exposition as well. Uh, as a footnote, this is also the, the site of the first major serial killer in American history, Dr. H.H. Holmes. I'm not going to dwell on that, but <laughs> at the heart of the Columbian Expo, for our purposes, is a competition for who has the best beer in the U.S., and both Anheuser-Busch and Pabst, of course, is, well, once they get this award, it'll mean all kinds of things for them in terms of selling more beer, so they go all out in terms of designing their pavilion for the White City, okay? Let's look at the Budweiser Pavilion first. This is a... Um, it's a sort of a dome structure with bottles all around it, and this is a 25 square foot uh, uh, scale model of the brewery. Okay, and is that that, it, uh, that craftsmen working for months carving out each piece of this, so it's sort of exactly. Uh, 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 replicated uh, the Anheuser Busch Brewery in St. Louis. Okay, so 25 foot scale model, intricately carved, pretty tough act to follow, right? What Pabst does is they also have a scale model. It's only about, it's only 13 square foot, but it is plated in gold. It's a gold <laughs> replica of the brewery, and um, and uh, and so. Um, it doesn't exist to this day. It's probably melted down at some point. But uh, here's the, 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 this, the, this, I think, bespeaks just how uh, how how competitive uh, this contest is between uh, AB on the one hand and Bush and, and uh, Pabst on the other. Okay, so the judges in charge of deciding which beer was better, uh, both sides. Um, uh, both sides try to bribe the judges. Some of the judges actually leave town rather than have to deal with this. The, the, it's never quite settled out as to who actually won the award for the best beer. But at one point, a majority of judges chose, chose Pabst over Anheuser-Busch. What's a common prize for first place at something? <laughs> Absolutely. Pabst <laughs> <laughs> claims victory. And uh, <laughs> this is sort of our, our flagship beer for Pabst going into even today, right? OK. <clears throat> Drinking like a German, again, in terms of uh, social drink. I'm sorry, let me back up. Do anybody, um, do, does anyone have any questions on, on sort of evolution of, of brewing uh, businesses in the US? And again, the, the, the preeminence of Germans and Wisconsin Germans in this uh, evolution. Any questions on that? Yes, ma'am. Just really quick, when I went to Lake Geneva, you know, they have Black Point, it was Conrad Schiff. And he mm -hmm. was, they said that he, after the Chicago fire, he was the one that um, kind of survived and um, was he pretty big, or...? Wait, that's that, a question. The, uh, Ship is the last name? Yeah, it was Conrad Sip. Conrad was, Ship. was that the name of the brewery as well? Well, he, he was a brewery. He was a I, work, he I was, work at Black Point. Okay. Hey, uh, 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 we, we have an expert in this. It's Conrad Sipe. Sipe. Okay, yeah. sorry. 1873, he's the largest brewer in America. Okay. He loses the title to Captain Pabst in 1874. Mm -hmm. They're really not mad at each other. Pabst is an honorary pallbearer at Sipe's funeral. Okay. Sipe is the largest German beer brewer in Chicago for 30 years. Yeah. Wow. And he is very successful after the uh, Chicago fire. Yeah. Wow. Because five yes. of 12 breweries burn in Chicago. Yes. And he's making lager for all those Germans rebuilding the city. <laughs> but of course, he's not making enough lager and a few folks from Milwaukee decide to chip in. 
<laughs> including the Eline brothers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know their uncle, Joseph Schlitz, uh, and uh, perhaps the uh, blast was first as well, but they're all shipping beer by scooter and then by rail overnight. Big operation. Schlitz was running 60 teams of horses every day in Chicago with the beer that they were shipping from Milwaukee. And of course, that's the beer that made <laughs> that was a much better answer. <laughs> so let's, just, uh, I mean, let's talk now about drinking like a German, shall we? Um, so here's the thing. Saloons in America up until this time period are uh, places where people go to not just take one or two drinks, but to get a buzz on. And they're also very much male spaces, right? That is, for the most part, women, respectable women at least, would not go out to saloons. It is some saloons did have uh, uh, places for women to drink, but there's actually a separate door for them to enter and leave by so they wouldn't have to, to, to mingle uh, with the men folk, right? So think about how different German beer gardens are, right? So this nice open space, we bring the entire family, even on Sundays sometimes, which does not go over well with a kind of Yankee or, uh, or New Englander um, uh, settlers to Wisconsin prior to the Germans. So there's a real sort of a tension that surfaces between uh, so-called Yankees, again, uh, Wisconsinites of New England descent, versus these new Germans uh, coming into the mid-19th mid century, right? Now, this, is, uh, this surfaces as a political issue with the formation of the Republican Party in the 1850s. I'm, I'm going to gloss over this because it's kind of complex to really get into. But what happens is, as all these Germans are moving to Wisconsin, this, of course, is a big part of the election. That's a lot of votes, uh, uh, um, sort of uh, for grabs there, and the, the sort of the, the constellation of political interests that end up coalescing in the Republican Party, which initially, as party of Lincoln, is founded pretty much on the sole issue of anti-slavery, right? That is that that's the, the origins of the Republican Party, in Wisconsin. Um, I won't even get into what it looks like today, but um, the the the. The, the, here's, here's the thing, is that prior to fastening on the issue of uh, anti-slavery, uh, there was an attempt by, again, the, some of the political groups that make up the Republican Party to try and make uh, prohibition or temperance their major issue. And given this big German presence in, in Milwaukee and thereabouts, that simply is not going to fly. Okay, what happens is in 1854, the Republican Party sort of, are, uh, sort of emerges as a major anti-slavery uh, group, making that pretty much the one issue in that election, and that's how they take over control of Wisconsin that year. Okay, so sort of a, this is a, a sort of a footnote to Wisconsin politics in terms of as early as the mid-19th uh, century, this German immigrant presence and the fact that uh, their, their cultural practices have to do, uh, I mean, are pretty much antithetical to temperance. This is a key element uh, in politics as early as the mid 19th century. Okay, here's an illustration of a Sunday in German beer hall, but um, all these Germans should be uh, praying or going to church. Wrong? I'm sorry? Is that date wrong? Yes, it is. It's about 100 years wrong. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, actually 18. Artists have gotten better in the interim. Yeah, it's, it's uh, from the late uh, 19th century. Thank you. Right? So Germans will open up a beer hall when they should be in church parade or something. Right? Okay. Right, uh, so. The Germans in politics and beer get a lot more interesting thereafter, as many of these uh, German immigrants are not just bringing their drinking culture with them; they're also bringing uh, they're also bringing their politics with them. Okay, and among them are a large number of socialists, more than a few anarchists, as we'll see. Okay, so in terms of immigrants and uh, politics, one of the first instances of conflict between uh, between sort of the, 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 the native sentiment and, the, and these German immigrants surfaces in the 1855 Lager Riot in Chicago. Where, uh, where the Chicago uh, government tries to restrict uh, the opening hours of, of um, German uh, beer halls. And the, and the Germans then stage a mass demonstration, which is then fired upon by the police. We end up with one dead, 60 wounded. Okay? And this is solely on the issue of, um, the, of the government trying to curtail Germans' um, practice of, of, of um, drinking public, right? 
throughout the course of the 19th century, we have more and more Germans coming along. We also have the rise of labor unions, and then also otherwise the anarchist movement um, in the U.S. So this is where uh, what's, bas what's basically a cultural tension between nativist and German sentiment turns out turns into actual political issues, right? So first off, with uh, uh, with uh, uh, on the first of May, 1884, one of the first real May Day demonstrations, 10,000 people go on strike in Milwaukee. That doesn't sound like much today, but that's the same number that turned out in uh, New York, 11,000 in Detroit, 30,000 in Chicago. So that's one of the four major sites of uh, demonstration in 1884. 1886, the Haymarket Affair, where a bomb is thrown into a uh, gathering, some police are killed, the police return fire, or the, the, uh, the police fire upon the crowd. The usual suspects, let's see, their names are Spies, Schwab, Fischer, Germany is rounded up, um, accused of this crime with really no evidence to this day proving them guilty. That didn't stop them from being, uh, most of them being uh, uh, executed. One of them got a life in, sentence, uh, life in prison commuted thereafter, right? Now, I'm showing that the very next day, the, 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 the Bayview Massacre in, in Milwaukee was a similar story of tension uh, uh, between workers and actually, in, um, in this case, representatives of the factory in which they worked. But again, uh, the forces of law and order fire upon workers, striking for things like the eight hour work day. That was the major issue at the time. And uh, here again, we see a number of workers killed. In this case, mostly Poles, although Germans are uh, the second largest ethnicity present at, at Bayview. Okay. So serious uh, uh, um, uh, 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 conflicts in the streets. Uh, uh, political conflicts between, um, well, between labor organizers, socialist anarchists on the one hand, forces of capital on the other, but this is then, uh, but, but, but it acquires an extra sort of cultural dimension because many of the former are Germans, many of the latter are not. Y'all with me on that? We see sort of a fusion of culture and politics going on here in the late 19th century. Does that make sense? Okay, good, good, good. Then also here's, here, here's uh, the flyer for the, for the Haymarket uh, gathering. English and German, right? Then knowing that the, for the audience, the, 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 uh, most, of them, most of them do speak English, but the second most likely common language is going to be German, right? So also for the evidence of just how important the German presence is in these movements. Okay, so Germans and prohibition. Um, let's see. The roots of prohibition really go back to the 19th century. Okay, and is, uh, with, the, with the second great uh, the second great awakening in, in, in the 1820s, at least the first major temperance movement. And here, with the, um, the sort of the, the cultural differences between um, uh, nativists or Yankees on the one hand and Germans on the other, I think really surface as immigrants are seen as a particularly in need of, of salvation, and saloons are seen as these dens, dens of iniquity in which every type of sin uh, uh, would be practiced on a regular basis. Right. So then, so the, the two major organizations in this regard are the WCTU, or the Women's Christian Temperance Union, founded in 1873. In 1893, the ASL, or the Anti-Saloon League, is founded as well. Now, the, sort of, um, in terms of thinking about prohibition, I, I want to just make, make, make one point very clear right here, is that a lot of the time, <laughs> that a, great <laughs> that a, a lot of the time prohibition is sort of portrayed as this sort of, um, the result of these the feisty ladies with axes going into bars and bust them up and ruin the good, ruin the good time everyone else is having, right? Why, why couldn't they just, you know, why they have to go and do that? So the, the, first off, I'm going to explain that it's much more complex than that. But secondly, we also have to take a moment and realize that at this time, women didn't have the vote. Uh, they were subject to uh, uh, domestic violence, deadbeat dads, things like that. And uh, so their one way for really trying to, uh, for trying to establish some political, I mean, the one issue on which they could uh, exert some uh, influence in public was on temperance, right? So it's really important not to sort of stereotype these, uh, uh, the, 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 the temperance um, uh, uh, activists as just these cranky ladies with axes. They, 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 there's a lot of problems in society, many of them having to do with male drinking. And this is the one way that they really have of, of, of expressing that. Let's be clear on that before we go on, okay? So, pre-prohibition -pro prohibition, or the temperance movement prior to the uh, 20th century. Here's the thing, is that many city and county governments have banned alcohol from the 1830s on, via the, via the use of, of the local option, right? This is a sort of uh, 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 local uh, county or city governments can go ahead and ban alcohol within their, uh, within um, the region they control. Uh, actually, by, 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 by 1909, half of all Americans, literally 50% of the country, lived in dry regions, and nine entire states have gone dry. But this, this is well before prohibition proper happens after World War I. 
Okay. The loopholes, though, are that interstate commerce is still uh, legit, so you can still go someplace to buy alcohol and come back and drink it in your home. And, uh, and then, uh, of course, there's still a number of, of regions in the country, mostly cities, in which uh, drinking culture carries on as much, much as before. We see um, a number of, 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 of these sort of captains of industry, Pullman um, and others among them, sort of uh, pay lip service to this trend towards temperance by, by making sure that the company towns that they found to build railroad cars or the things are themselves dry. So the workers uh, go to work 8, 10, 12 hours a day, get off work, and they get to have a nice cold glass of water instead of something <laughs> <clears throat> Can't say how to prove that much. <laughs> so, um, so, so, of of our three key, sorry, or of what I see as the three key elements going into prohibition. One is this temperance movement going back to the 1830s, right? The second, I think, has to do with economics, has to do with where money is coming from for the U.S. government, which right up until 1913, the major source of revenue for the government was taxes on alcohol production. Right, so that, that that's that that's the major source of revenue, and the government is not about to um, not about to stop people making beer because that's attacking them right where right where it counts in um, the purse strings. Right, so this changes in 1913 as the 16th Amendment uh, uh, legalizes an income tax. That is, the, the the government can now tax individual people's income. Brand new source of revenue for the government, and brewing becomes less important. Right. That is, whereas previously revenues from brewing were uh, central to making the government run, keeping the lights on, as of 1913, they become much less important. Okay? Moreover, that same year, the, uh, the Webb Kenyon Act closes the interstate loophole where interstate commerce and alcohol is now banned. It's illegal. So, th th so these are the, the, there's some key elements going into World War I that I think also uh, uh, comprise the second sort of strain of, of, uh, of, uh, what, we get, of what ends up with prohibition after World War I. Okay? Any questions before I go on? We're gonna we're gonna go to war here shortly. No, no. Okay. So here come the Germans, part three, World War One, right? That is that uh, in 1914, Europe goes to war. Now the U.S. doesn't join the Triple Entente until 1917, right? But um, what we see happening in World War One, as it becomes swiftly obvious that the war is not going to be over um, uh, in short order, is that society is mobilized for total war. This involves uh, sending millions of women to work in the uh, munitions factories because uh, uh, men are out fighting, but it also involves uh, extensive domestic surveillance and domestic uh, propaganda as well, right? That is, uh, all governments involved, the US included, uh, resorts to both propaganda and surveillance as a means of uh, creating and maintaining support for the war effort, okay? So in the US, we see the formation of the CPI, or the Committee on Public Information. Uh, this is a government body dedicated towards uh, telling Americans things about the war that will maintain their support for it. I gotta call that propaganda, I'm sorry. And then, um, because Germans are the enemy, this is exactly where uh, this sort of like, stirring up these passions against Germany to vouch is directly upon uh, the German Americans uh, living in this country. It doesn't matter they've been here for two, three generations, this is when uh, German Americans would have to prove their loyalty, okay? Um, so just, just uh, some examples of this World War I propaganda. Destroy this mad brute. Here's this, uh, this, this uh, ape with a, with, a, with a Kaiser Wilhelm helmet storming across the Atlantic. Uh, the way to stop this from happening is to enlist in the US Army, right? We've got uh, the Kaiser himself, the bloody saber coming across the ocean. Note that the ocean floor is carpeted with the bodies of women and children. The way to stop that is to enlist in the Navy, right? <coughs> Um, how are we gonna how how are we gonna defeat the Germans? Well, we're gonna buy Liberty Bonds, or else then this this this, this demonic figure is going to uh, to crush us, right? Think about being subjected to this type of propaganda on a daily basis throughout the course of the war, right? It's really sort of it's really uh, incessantly telling Americans that the enemy is Germans. It's very possible that some of the people in our midst of German extraction are themselves perhaps in cahoots with the foreign powers, spies, or what have you. Okay. Um, uh, oh, and and, and, and this, this is a poster for the Four Minute Men. This is a cohort of, I think, 75,000 uh, men who went all throughout the country giving speeches on the necessity of the US being in the war. And, and the speeches were always only four minutes long because that was how long um, attention spans were thought to last at the time. Boil it down to four minutes to make sure everyone gets the message. 
course, by this time, I've lost you guys like 10 times. So. <laughs> I, hope that's, I hope that's not the case. But yeah, this concerted effort by the government to, in essence, domestic propaganda, convincing Americans that Germans are the enemy, has this backlash against the German-American community, OK? And this, this uh, fascinating document here on this next page, I wish I could take credit for having found it, but uh, I actually got this from one of our graduates in the history department, Adam Mazzolino, who did his, uh, his senior thesis on, um, on uh, uh, surveillance in Sheboygan during World War I. Well, what he found was, from, from the Bureau, the, um, he found this document in the, in the Bureau of Investigation Archives, that the BI is the precursor of the FBI. And this is a record of uh, surveillance at the Pabst Brewery in Milwaukee, right? According to uh, the agent in charge, uh, quote, the Pabst Brewery workers are practically all socialists and pro-German, and many of them have made statements that they recognize no flag but the red flag. So it's sort of a lighting difference between German and socialist tendencies, but they're definitely not like us. They're definitely un-American, right? Um, the, uh, and perhaps not surprisingly, these breweries, being German, start to, much as anti-German sentiment, start to get down in the directions of the breweries themselves, the brewery owners themselves as well, right? Okay, so anti-German uh, sentiment reaches such a fever pitch that in a handful of cases, such as that of Robert Prager, a uh, German like, organizer, socialist, anti-war activist, he's actually taken out back and lynched in Collinsville, Illinois, 1918. They actually, um, they are applied enough to give him a chance to write a letter to his parents beforehand, then they string him up for his uh, un-American activities, right? Um, so, just to, to sort of like, I guess, to, to, I guess to go into a bit more detail about the broad gamut of how anti-German sentiment manifests as a result of this propaganda and uh, previous cultural differences going into World War I. Germans and German Americans are seen as dubious loyalty at best, right? Uh, German bars are sites of un-American activity. That's where these German socialists get together and plot, of course, or anarchists or worse. Uh, in terms of German culture, there's a real uh, there's a real backlash against German culture, both in terms of the language. Um, no, just, just, just an example of that. My my, my mother's uh, maiden name is Muller, M-U-L-L-E-R. Part of World War One, it was Mueller, right? Uh, Mueller, Mueller, right? But um, but one way to demonstrate that you were being a good American was to Americanize your name. Same is true of, of uh, uh, a set of sauerkraut. We're going to call it. Freedom. <laughs> Liberty Catch, right? Liberty Catch. <laughs> That's Freedom Fries for a much more recent uh, uh, conflict, right? But um, so there's a change in the language, right? But also even, but in terms of, 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 sort of one of the stranger episodes in this story, there is a production of William Tell being put on in Milwaukee. Uh, this sort of being sort of the, 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 this sort of a Germanic text, I suppose. And a couple of, um, and, um, uh, some uh, well-meaning Americans put up a machine gun across from the theater at which it was being shown. If you want to go and see German culture, do so at your own risk. Right? This comes down to going to a play. Right? Okay, and, and central to our point, though, is the German breweries are suspect, too. There's a, oh, let me just find a source here. Yeah. Oh, okay. It's a great book, by the way. We have a John Strange, a former lieutenant governor of Wisconsin, gives a speech in Milwaukee in 1918, uh, in which he warns against German, em uh, in which he warns against German enemies across the water. And he goes on to add, "Quote: We have German enemies in this country too, and the worst of all our German enemies, the most treacherous, the most menacing, are Pabst, Schlitz, Blatz, and Miller." Right? They are the worst Germans who ever afflicted themselves on, on long suffering people. No Germans in the war are conspiring against the peace and happiness of the United States more than Pabst, Schlitz, Blatz, Miller, and others of their kind. Right? So, again, most, most uh, breweries in Wisconsin, and actually most of them in the US, are owned by Germans. This anti German sentiment actually turns right back around to, uh, to, to point the finger not just at these anarchists and socialists in the street, but the actual brewery owners. Uh, uh, who, again, despite being second, third, fourth generation American, are still seen as German when it comes down to it in this heightened uh, 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 wartime mentality, right? Okay, so there's a John Strange speech. The brewers are also uh, subject to uh, surveillance and lawsuits. There's an entire government office called the uh, Custodian of, uh, of Alien Property, which is in charge of, uh, of uh, confiscating alien property, and the guys who run that figure the breweries. 
that's a, that's a lot of property to confiscate for money trying to uh, for, for government trying to raise money to, to 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 win a war, right? So the Marines are sub are are subject to uh, intrusive surveillance, lawsuits, uh, 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 the, the deliberate fomenting of this anti-German sentiment, and this culminates in Lily Bush's experience in Key West in 1918. Okay, uh, Lily Bush is uh, 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 one of the scions of the Anheuser Busch family, and when the war breaks out, she's actually stuck in Europe at the time. So for three, four years there, she's stuck in Europe. She can't get back to the U.S. She finally does so via Key West. But by this time, anti-German sentiment is so pronounced that uh, as soon as she, as soon as her uh, feet touch American soil, uh, she is uh, uh, she is uh, incarcerated. She's subjected to a uh, strip search and a full body search on the suspicion that she's bringing in messages because she's a German spy. This is this is one of the members of the Anheuser uh, uh, of the Bush family who's treated this way. Okay. Um, so, this is where we get prohibition coming just after World War I, okay? Because it becomes a patriotic issue. If you aren't for prohibition, you're probably uh, a socialist or anarchist or some other flavor of un American person we don't want here, right? This direct linkage between, uh, between um, if you believe in U.S. and believe in the war, you got to be for prohibition. Okay, so this then is really, I think, the third strain of of causes for prohibition. It's sort of a perfect storm of causes, as I as I say on this page, right? With the temperance movement going back to the 19th century, we have the government not needing revenue from pro, from alcohol as much after 1913. But then during the war, especially, we see this uh, anti-German sentiment surface, initially directed towards anarchists, socialists, and other radicals like that but then actually turning towards the owners of the breweries themselves during the course of the war. And this then culminates in the 18th Amendment and the Volstead Act, uh, ratified in 1919, goes in effect 1920, and prohibition is in full effect for the next 13 years. Right? As a footnote before I wrap up, prohibition, for its bad reputation, actually kind of works in terms of getting Americans to work less. Right? What we have here is uh, uh, to drink less. Uh, in terms of getting Americans to drink less, right? So here's per capita consumption in the US uh, of uh, beer versus spirits in gallons. What we see happening throughout the, uh, what we see happening in, in, in the 19th century is beer becoming much more popular than spirits. And then going to 1915, alcohol in general becoming pretty popular in terms of um, Let's see, 30 gallons of beer and 2.5 gallons of spirits per capita, per person, per year. That's a lot. That's a lot, right? But see, um, after prohibition is, is, uh, is all over, we're all said and done, uh, consumption has gone right back down to late 19th century levels. And American uh, drinking does not re resume its 1850 levels until 1970, right? So, um, of course, people who wanted alcohol were able to get it during Prohibition, especially if you're better off or live closer to a border or something like that. But, I mean, broadly speaking, in terms of the government trying to control the way people act, uh, we have to see it as a qualified success, I would say, for what it's worth, right? 1950 to 1970. Okay, so what? Um, <clears throat> well, the, uh, in my history of beer class, I think also today what I'm trying to show is that looking at beer in history can tell us a lot of different things about the societies, cultures, and times in question, right? Oh, we see how beer and culture are embedded going right back to ancient uh, times of the Roman Empire. We see how immigrants, uh, that, uh, uh, we see how tensions between immigrants and pre existing populations, we can see how those are mediated via drinking practices, right? That is, uh, uh, some of the time, uh, the issues on which immigrants and uh, so called Yankees clash is precisely who drinks what in what context, where, what day of the week, not the Sabbath, right? We've also seen how beer becomes political, right? That is that, is that as these um, uh, that is that the ownership of these breweries, World War I, uh, even prior to that, the saloons being seen as sites of anti-American activity, fomenting unrest, anarchists plotting bombs, what have you, there's, there's real political valence to drinking practices. I think also we've seen that when beer goes to war, uh, 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 we finally get prohibition as a result, right? Now let me skip another uh, 70 years or so and skip to the present, where uh, in the news just recently, there's, uh, uh, there, there's uh, supposedly the possibility of Anheuser-Busch Imbev and Miller Coors, and, and Miller Coors merging to form one big brewery that would control 70% 70, 70 of the American market. Right? So we've gone from this sort of history of, uh, of thousands of breweries in the past to, to, to corporate conglomeration, to corporate conglomeration of uh, one brewery after another being snapped up by these, multi by these multinational corporations, 
Same time, though, we have the rise of, of the craft brewing industry uh, in the U.S., where actually this year there are, more, there, are at, there are more breweries than ever before in this country as, as uh, craft breweries keep on opening up uh, throughout the country. So what the future holds uh, could be a bureaucracy, as, as, as I put it here, sort of a monopoly by this one big beer corporation. Maybe craft brew will uh, continue to, uh, to thrive. But in any case, whatever happens going forward, it's going to have some German roots. Right? Can I say something funny? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we could actually make a test, you know, if you go to a ballpark, instead of paying the American music, just put some polka music on and see what it would do to the whole, to the whole stadium. See how many people start to... That's funny. Well, that's what I have for you. Then I have a slide with some suggestions for further reading. If you're interested in those. But um, thank you for your time. Um, but I'll take any questions you have. I just have a comment. Yes, um, Have you been over to Potosi, Wisconsin, to the American Brewery? I, I haven't been there yet. It's one of my favorite museum? beers. It's, oh, no. It's a museum. Okay. Excellent. I will do so. And you, sir, in the back. And my name is Knipp. Okay. My great-grandfather had a brewery in Janesville. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was called Kettle Shop in Knipp. Mm -hmm. It was the largest brewery in Rock County. Mm -hmm. 5,000 barrels of beer. Per year. Per year. Okay. Uh, the, in the... And he bought it from Bub originally. Okay. And then um, it was Knipp's City Brewery. And he sold it in 1906 to Crow. Okay. Pro lost it in prohibition. A lot of breweries get through prohibition by making uh, 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 malt beverages or various other processes related to brewing. Most of them they'll go under, right? That is, uh, again, uh, uh, um, the, the, there's, I think, at the end of prohibition, there's something like 190 breweries left in the U.S., right? So this is really something of course, there's breweries right out. next to the Tallman House, so I imagine that might have oh. had something to do with it. <laughs> 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 on Narrow Point Road. Okay. <laughs> right down the river. Well, Thank nice. you. And he got his ice out of the water. Gotcha. Gotcha. You, sir. The Japanese were all rounded up in World War II. How come the Germans weren't rounded up in World War I? Yes, um, there's a lot more of them. Yeah. Yeah. It would have been a lot yeah. bigger, I mean, a lot bigger project. Japanese American internment in World War II is about a, between 100 and 120,000 people. Okay, so uh, the German population of the U.S. is more, a lot more. <laughs> so I think it would have been impossible. The thing is also that, uh, I mean, many German Americans went to great lengths to prove their patriotism, right? They changed their names. Uh, um, um, uh, the owner of the Bush Parade at the time, one of the Adolphuses, I think, I mean, went to great lengths to, uh, uh, to let his factories be used for, uh, for making stuff for the war, things like that. So, I mean, a lot of, I mean, despite this high level of anti-German sentiment, uh, the, the same type of, of incarceration was never really envisioned, right? They were machines, huh? Machinists making weapons, that's the reason why they were determined. Yes, we need them, we need them doing stuff. Yes, ma'am, thank you. Uh, my grandfather came from Austria just before World War I, and he had been working as a royal tailor for the Habsburgs. So he came to Milwaukee and designed the uh, Catholic Knights of Columbus uniform. But uh, when World War I broke out, uh, people in Milwaukee, were obviously not German, burned his tailor shop down. Mm -hmm. And he had to go into a guest house, and my grandmother cooked, but of course, the big thing was the beer. And then with Prohibition, my father was always telling me about how difficult it was because they couldn't sell beer. So no matter what my poor grandfather did, seem to not work out too well. Right, right. And, 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 and see, today we've really forgotten, I think, the, the, the degree and type of anti-German sentiment we saw during the war. But I mean, I mean compared to some of the, the, the anti-Muslim sentiment we saw after 9-11, I mean, there's just this, uh, and when, when, when countries go to war and governments start, you know, trying to shape popular opinion, it's pretty easy to find some scapegoats, some, some minorities, demonize them and use them to mobilize the rest of the mass. Is that, I mean, absolutely, yeah. Yes. Yeah, my dad spoke about his, his books, catechisms, Bibles being burned down in southeastern Missouri. Mm -hmm. uh, that was World War I time. Mm -hmm. But in World War II, we heard a speaker at um, Black Hawk last year who spoke of uh, German internment during World War II and said the numbers were about equal to the Japanese. 
and that's there were camps all over the United States. Are those mostly German POWs, though? Yeah. 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 No. Yes. No. Yes. No. 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 There were no. some issues. Wait. Area. There were some. Okay. Okay. So um, that's something that I should look into more. I know that there's some. I mean, the uh, uh, Italians also are incarcerated. In, I think right. smaller numbers in uh, World War II as well. But. Um, it's my impression that most of the Germans interned during World War II were POWs who, 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 who find themselves in camps, like in the Midwest, Iowa, and elsewhere. The numbers you were talking about were people who perhaps didn't have citizenship yet. Ah, okay. And their kids, even if they were citizens. Good. They talk about the whole family's gone, mm -hmm. and the boy is still going to high school, and one day they come to school, handcuff him during World War II, and haul him off to the camp that his folks are in. Right. And he was a citizen. Right. So uh, he had numbers that were way up there of these people. Mm -hmm. I'll flick into that. Yeah, yeah there's, there's nowhere near as much literature on German or Italian American internment in World yeah. War II as there is on Japanese American. The speaker lives in Palatine. Yes. Oh, right. Sir. Do you know uh, back in Germany when American, the Milwaukee and St. Louis breweries were grabbing the market, did uh, consolidation go on in Germany too, or did they maintain their regional or local? Ooh, you're talking more like after World War II, mostly, right? When sort of when, that, when there's this flood of American commodities into Europe. Well, <laughs> Schlitz and Anheuser, that was in the 19th century, right? Yeah, but that's mostly domestic consumption, uh, far as I can tell. It is. I mean, <coughs> European. I mean, there's a lot of powerhouse uh, breweries in Europe uh, as well, of course. And now um, it seems, for the most part, the German breweries tend to be smaller, and there's more of them. Uh, going to the 20th century, but um, it's my impression that most, uh, uh, that the real sort of like moment when American beer starts to penetrate the European market is after World War II, for what it's worth. Right. Other questions? Yes. How, did, how did the breweries uh, survive prohibition? How, how did they adapt? Well, most of them didn't. Um, wasn't go out of business. Uh, some of them just closed down, and and and, and, and people who owned them just kind of hoped for the best. They need it, it doesn't really last uh, 13 years, right? But the other thing is that there's a number of parts of the brewing process that you can use to make other commodities. Uh, uh, malt beverages, for one. Uh, uh, yeast for baking. Ice cream is a natural uh, sort of um, uh, alternate thing to make. Um, none of these things are uh, uh, give the same profit. But there are other ways to use all that brewing equipment instead of just letting it rust, right? So, so again, most breweries simply did, they went out of business. I mean, prohibition was brutal for the American brewing industry. But those that did survive did so by marking other things or simply closing the doors and waiting for a change in the weather, right? Okay. Yes, sir. Oh, I just want to say that I think most German Americans were very patriotic. And my father volunteered for World War II. Unfortunately, though, he was colorblind and had flat feet and maybe hemorrhoids, and I don't know why they denied him, but he was 4F and couldn't serve. But he did have three sons, and I'm one of them. And uh, one served in Germany in the service, uh, another in Vietnam, and the youngest one ended up being a captain of the Special Forces. So I'm sure he'd been quite proud. <laughs> yeah, I mean, again, it's... I mean, just because people were of German extraction didn't mean they were disloyal. They were born here, some never been back to Germany, right? This whole, this sort of, I mean, it's, it's a, I think it's striking just how uh, readily this minority was demonized in the war. And again, the parallels to the Japanese Americans World War II, I would say again, uh, Muslim Americans after 9-11. This happens, this seems to happen more often. Uh, it seems to happen periodically throughout American history. Uh, sir, and then, yes. Do you have any commentary on the uh, Bloomer Brewery, the Huber Brewery, and on the Minhaus Brewery over in Monroe? In Monroe. Are they still brewing there? Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. And they're, um, it's are a they wonderful also? tour. Of They've yeah. never yeah. taken it. Five dollars if you buy it on Groupon, ten bucks at the door. Okay. And Huber, I think, is now, are they now owned by? Minhaus. Minhaus. Okay. Minhaus. But who is Minhaus owned by? They're Canadian. Uh, Sister and brother. Right. Okay. okay. My gotcha. parents were big, I think, in the liquor stores and other ventures up in Canada. Gotcha. Gotcha. Now, awesome? I've, I have a lot of research to do on this project, both awesome. in, uh, in archives as well as bars and breweries. So I, I look forward to doing that. So you had a question. I was going to offer some more answers to how did the company stay in business. A couple in Milwaukee, uh, the Eline family, Schlitz, uh, made chocolate. 
Uh, and there were chocolate bars spelled E L I N E, much easier spelling than the German. The U I H, right? Uh, and passed, and of course, had his big farm in Oconomowoc, where right. he'd been raising uh, Percher on horses, his equivalent of uh, Clydesdale yeah. in St. Louis. And he switched to making a cheese and switched to dairy company. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Gotcha. Because I mean, uh, brewing equipment is a lot of stainless steel, food grade machinery that you can use for uh, for ice cream, for cheese, things like that. Totally. Yes. Good. Yeah. Sir. Oops. Bye. Sorry. You next. Go ahead. What's your favorite beer? <laughs> <laughs> oh wow! There are so many to choose from. Yeah. Uh, no. No. Um, I'm from Fort Collins, Colorado, so that, and, and that's as and that's sort of a, a beer mecca these days. But my favorite is a beer called Odell. Uh, they have an IPA that's probably my favorite thing in the world. Um, I hasten to note, shameless plug for my friends who are in Second Salem, is that we're making some pretty good beer up in Whitewater right now. If you want to mosey up and try that little brewery, it's going pretty well. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and I, I want to say because of the beer, I have tried because you know, I miss the beer from Germany, and I have tried different kinds from what you know from the stores you can get here, and I truly can say I think the Miller is really the closest one from the taste. No, making no commercials. I'm not here for Miller. I'm, sorry. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just saying I truly believe um, the Miller is one of the closest one in the favor in the, in the taste in the favor and the flavor okay. in comparison to the German ones, even though they added the chemicals here. Well, well rice so, is a major adjunct that changes yeah. the flavor, right? So, and bringing me to, back to my question about when did they add actually the chemicals? Is it, was it because of the law here? Um, um, well, the, the, uh, the, the major difference between um, between beer styles before and after the, the so-called German invasion is, is the addition of rice as an adjunct. Oh, okay. Now, various chemicals are used in the brewing process. Um, to speed of the fermentation, also um, when you're mashing barley, you want your pH to be 5.3, so, so you'll acidify it. If the pH is too high, you'll you'll add some kind of some, some, some kind of base or something that's too low. I mean, there's a lot of chemicals that you add to beers, um, so I'm not sure exactly what you're talking about. Oh, but, 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 but this is something that that, that has really been uh, that's part and parcel of of uh, bring science going back to Pasteur, right? That is, as people figured out how to dial in recipes and mashes and pH and things like that. They've used chemicals uh, uh, to make that happen. Okay. Yeah. All right, thank you. Other questions? You still drink your beer warm? Oh, uh, actually, that's, that's actually a good question. Okay, well, well, okay, may I say this? Okay, so in, in Germany, because there's absolutely no chemicals in there, so the beer, if you buy the bottle of beer, it has an expiration date, and it's supposed to be actually lagered, like, you can put them in a basement where it's cold, but not it's not supposed to go actually in a refrigerator. But you know how time has changed, and the temperature in Germany is not the climate is not the same as here as hot it is here. So you can actually have a good cold beer in a basement if you have a house. If you don't have a house, you 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 know you have to put it in a refrigerator. But I do like cold beer. I do like especially the beer when it's in a in a great mug. A mug and a beer belongs together. It's like you know, drinking a beer from a bottle, it's just, well, it's something mm -hmm. missing, you know? Mm -hmm. Right. In terms of drinking beer warm versus cold, what you try sometime is uh, taste it cold first, and then let it warm up a bit, because what you'll find is that the actual uh, flavor profile is much more apparent as it warms up. I mean, it's cold, it's just a cold mm -hmm. beverage right. you're just drinking, but it warms up, uh, you get a better sense of the, different kind of the different types of malts and hops going into it. I mean, it's not as refreshing or whatever, but you, but you get a better sense of what that beer tastes like. That's true. For what it's yeah, I've been to Germany twice. I love the hard rolls. That's the first thing I have to have. <laughs> in 1860, it was uh, hard to put it in the refrigerator. <laughs> 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 the refrigeration is invented not long after that. Right? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, ice, ice. Sure. Excellent. Yeah. About a third of the ice harvested in America was used for brewing beer. Oh, a third. Oh. Another I'd third to the meat packers. Yeah. And the third third to domestic. Use. To domestic, right, right. Use both for, right, for both in, in the brewing process or just for process uh, and, and storage. Gotcha. Gotcha. Interesting. Interesting. One of the reasons Milwaukee ended up being the larger beer producer than Chicago. Location, location, location. They had better teams. <laughs> <laughs>
Better caves. Easier to lager beer. Caves. And lager means keep it cool. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Lager is a word that means like locker or storage or resting. It's also the beer style, which leads to some confusion sometimes. Yeah. Pale versus yeah. lager is the two basic beer styles. comes from the beer word lager. Alrighty then, I wonder, let's see, any last questions well, I can field for you? To the bar. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry? I said to the bar. <laughs> to the bar. <laughs> Sir. Despite the efforts of the prohibitionists to portray the German beer gardens as down of iniquity and uh, alcoholics, the Germans themselves, it was more of a social gathering. Right? Exactly right, yeah. exactly right. I mean, this, this is, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying it's a great idea to take your entire family to a bar and stay there all day, but it's better than the male head of household doing so, leaving the wife at home with the kids. That's just not fair in my, of course, 20th, 21st century thing to say, but I mean, you can see where it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's different. I would argue much healthier drinking culture, honestly. Ma'am. The first time I was in Hofbrauhaus, maybe 1975, they still had the copper tank, and the um, beer came down in barrels, wooden barrels, not a, not refrigerated. There wasn't any of these metal things. But the German guys would bring their stein, and they would go psh, 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 in the copper tank and put a piece a napkin in it and stick it in their locker. Yeah, <laughs> it's nice. it tasted completely different. It might be the same beer now, but it wasn't the same without that ambiance. I'm sure of it. Yeah. I'm sure of it. I'm sure. All right. Well, if we're done here, I'll thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.